Welcome to the second session of our, our symposium uh, on the human response to God. Um, it's great to see you all back with us this morning. As we start another day, uh, let's just commit our day to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your presence with us today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be here, that your Spirit would be working through our presenters, through our respondents, and in the conversations that take place between us. So we just ask for that blessing of your presence and your guidance and your leading into truth throughout this day. In Christ's name we ask it and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Professor Gavento was our Lund lecturer yesterday, so for the second time in two days, it's my great privilege to introduce her. Uh, we had uh, a rich time with Professor Gavento yesterday and were greatly blessed by what she had to bring, and I'm sure it will be the same this morning. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to her and ask her to speak to us on the theme of which humans, what response, a reflection on Pauline theology. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Chester, and thanks to all of you uh, for this wonderful opportunity for conversation uh, and reflection on an amazing topic. One of the things that fascinated me as I was thinking about the paper was uh, the openness of the topic, and I, uh, I resisted the urge, you know, like the good little girl that I still am somewhere inside, uh, to write to Klein Snodgrass and say, now, what do you mean by this? You know, what, what could, I, because, because I had already decided what I wanted to do and I didn't want him to tell me otherwise. <laughs> um, I am, I'm, I'm interested by the way in which each of us has parsed this topic in a slightly different direction, depending on our own background, interest, and field, and yet there are many overlaps, uh, and I'm, I'm, I think that's, going to make for a great conversation. I started my own reflection really with a subtitle, uh, the, re the response to the divine initiative. What comes to mind for me with that is the many ways in which we uh, imagine people being confronted with uh, the gospel, whether it is on, in a uh, contemporary scene, a pastor preaching in a church, uh, or, uh, because I tend to live more in the first century, uh, whether it looks like uh, the, the uh, Pentecost speech of, Steve, of uh, Peter or any number of uh, scenes from the book of Acts. Uh, in all of those scenarios, whether ancient or modern, what comes to mind, I think, for, uh, for many of us is um, a confrontation or an offer, um, a setting in which people are exposed to the gospel and are in a position to hear and decide, to listen and to accept or refuse. Uh, think of Paul on the Areopagus, uh, where mostly there is refusal with some uh, snickering on the side as people go off to Starbucks to talk about the crazy man who's in town. Um, what happens, the question I pose in the paper uh, to the ancient world is what happens when we throw into that some other things we know, namely that slavery was ubiquitous in the Roman world and that many of those who uh, became Christian uh, were themselves slaves. Uh, I, I think that is without, without dispute. Uh, we also know that slaves in the ancient world, as was the case in the, uh, in the South, in this country, slaves were subject to sexual use by their owners. I think th both of those things are, uh, are not uh, under dispute. Um, we also know that among the earliest ethical exhortations that we find in the New Testament and beyond is a concern about sexual immorality. In part, I think that comes out of a, the Jewish uh, bias, if you will, the Jewish notion that Gentiles are sexually promiscuous. 
So this carries over into early Christian, into early Christian uh, paranesis, the concern about sexual uh, misconduct. So you have some issues that come here into collision. If you have slaves who are themselves Christian, who have no control over their own bodies, confronted with uh, the demand that they uh, uh, not engage in sexual practice outside of marriage, we have a problem. This has been articulated very well by Jennifer Glancy. I have a footnote to her on page three, uh, and uh, Lynn Osick and Margaret McDonald, uh, who are asking questions about, what, uh, about things that we, we have no access to, but they, they do set up a kind of dilemma. Uh, were these slaves then, was their practice tolerated? Uh, were they subject to uh, uh, some kind of exemption? Were they themselves looked down upon? How were they viewed in light of this, this teaching? Um, I introduced that, I hope that became clear in the paper. The bottom, I'm at the bottom of page three now. I introduced that complex set of issues as a way of drawing a, a question mark against any account of the human response to the divine that prioritizes human capacity, whether it's moral capacity or intellectual capacity or physical capacity. Now, I use that in a very large uh, sense here, both to talk about uh, limitations that are imposed by the outside, that is, by a slave system, and limitations that may be biological in nature. Uh, and, and I realize that I am putting together things that in, in many other respects don't belong together, except that they touch at this one crucial element, point having to do with one's ability, for whatever reason, to act. Um, and I'm looking at this with, through the lens of Paul, uh, most particularly through Romans. Um, as people who were there yesterday know, I've been working now for quite a while on a commentary on Romans, so whatever question is asked me, the answer is apt to come. Well, Romans says this, that, or the other. Um, we turn to Romans and we look at two passages that came up yesterday in conversation, both Romans 6 and Romans 12. Paul says, Present yourselves to God. Present your bodies to God. Uh, but um, what does it mean to admonish people to present themselves to God, to present their members to righteousness? I'm at the bottom of page five now. If that physical body actually belongs to a human master who is in control of uh, if not all, most of that person's actions, uh, even the most intimate relationships. What kind of, um, wh what are we to make of that potential conflict? Now, I, I, I know there are some ways of getting Paul off the hook here by saying that he's not really talking about presenting the whole body, this is spiritual language and so forth. I've tried to, to address that briefly and to set that aside. Um, on page seven, I then make a huge leap uh, to say this is not an isolated issue. That is to say, the, uh, on the one hand, we could look at the question of ancient slavery and say, well, that was then. We don't practice slavery. This has nothing to do with us. Uh, issues of capacity are not, uh, are not contemporary. And I'm going to go ahead and argue that, in fact, uh, that's a very nice way of saying this is the tip of the iceberg, uh, because there are all sorts of people in our own time who face uh, very similar situations, who cannot respond with faith, if by that we mean cognitive assent. They cannot respond with the full person because of limitations that are placed on them in one way or another. Um, 
we might think, first of all, of child worker, child soldiers or sex workers, and this will come up in Paul Lim's paper as well. It is not only, however, slavery in a modern guise that constitutes a problem for response. What response to God is to be expected from those who live with severe intellectual disability or severe mental illness or addictions of various sorts. So again, I, I am uh, rather boldly placing in one heading uh, for this purpose uh, a number of ways in which people's, possibi people's capacities are diminished in order to problematize some of the ways in which we think about the human response to God. Now, I know it could be objected that, that I'm beginning, I'm majoring in minors here. I talked about this paper uh, with a colleague of mine who said, oh, well, why would you begin there? Well, I think there are two very good reasons for doing that, and I've tried to outline those on page eight. Uh, for one thing, a very practical uh, matter, this is a fact of human life. All of us live one slip uh, away from having severely diminished capacity um, of, of, of at least a mental cognitive sort. Uh, the second reason, and far more important to me, is a theological reason. Uh, and I want to highlight this because it's crucial for what I'm trying to say here. Beginning, I'm on the middle of page eight, beginning with incapacity reveals the limited and indeed deeply flawed ways in which we think about humanity in relationship to God. It reveals the way we privilege certain gifts over others, and it presses us to think more deeply about what does constitute a genuinely human response to God's initiative. Here, one of my conversation partners becomes uh, John Swinton's uh, marvelous book on dementia. Uh, I get no money from the sale of that book, um, but I will say, especially for those of you who are pastors, you just need to read this book. Uh, whether you are currently in a context where you have a number of people who are themselves struggling with dementia or their families are or not, that's, uh, dementia is the beginning here for a, a very practical theology, a, a very practical theological anthropology. This is simply one of the most important books I've read in a long time. I did hear that, so. Uh, just don't tell him I said anything nice about him because I wouldn't want to disturb the relationship. No. Um, con con considering, uh, well, I'm sorry, I got off and didn't come back to the point I wanted to make. Uh, Persons suffering from dementia are routinely characterized as being no longer themselves. I've used that language myself. And once you read the book, it just it horrifies you that you've said that. Uh, being abandoned by God. Uh, this person is not there anymore. You know, my, my grandmother isn't there anymore. Uh, it struck me when I read that that that's exactly the kind of language you find used of slaves in the ancient world. This is not a person. This is the way that we stigmatize people and then no longer have to deal with them. So considering Swinton's work and going back to the letters of Paul, uh, we might say Paul is simply not helpful um, because Paul seems to us to emphasize human intellectual and physical capacity, uh, this, the notion of making a profession of faith uh, seems to us to be prominent in his letters. I'm going to contend that that's because we have a distorted understanding of Paul. The first problem, uh, which I hinted at uh, as I began, is that we have a, an inadequate understanding, I'm on page 10 now, of God's action in the world in Jesus Christ. Um, we proceed as if Christianity is an offer that God makes to humanity. This is something I talked about yesterday at some length. An offer that is conditional on a human response. And certainly there are uh, elements in Paul's letters that read just that way. Uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17 being perhaps the most famous. 
or Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All of these passages attend to human faith, but they stand alongside another strand in Romans and elsewhere, which reflects the notion that in Jesus Christ, God acted unilaterally to reclaim the world from powers that held it captive, most notably powers of sin and death. Um, and I think in, in Romans as a whole, we also we see as part of this strand that God's saving action extends to the whole of humankind, indeed to the whole of the cosmos. In addition, page 12, uh, I take up what I, what I understand to be a distorted understanding of pistis. Uh, I think this was a, a, an issue that was uh, uh, underneath the conversation last night. We reduce belief to a narrow, intellectual, even propositional sense. Uh, I assert certain things. I am able to, to put yes to the statement uh, God was in Jesus Christ. We don't take fully into account the range of the Greek noun pistis and the related verb. Uh, but pistis can mean confidence, trust, uh, uh, trustworthiness. When Paul talks in Romans 3 about God's pistis, he doesn't mean God's belief. He means God's faithfulness. Um, moving along, page 13, However, we translate, and translating is only the tip of the iceberg, uh, it's crucial to see that Paul speaks about human faith and how it came into being in a variety of ways, one of which is uh, revelation, apocalypse, uh, which for him is very close to another way talking about being overtaken. Uh, Philippians 3.12, Paul himself says he was overtaken by Jesus Christ, being called into faith. And of course, when we talk about pistis as belief, we sometimes neglect the role of the spirit. This is not just, as I see it, a translation problem. It is a symptom of our corrupt understanding of the human being, the bottom of page 13. Our understanding of the human response depends on the notion of abilities, whether they are cognitive or moral or physical, rather than on the notion of giftedness, of giftedness. Um, I'm watching my time here and thinking I'm going to move along, uh, skipping this section, but in, um, in Paul, it's quite clear that what, is, what the human being has in relation to God is, uh, is itself a gift. I'm drawn here to 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Uh, the human response to the divine initiative is itself also an outworking of the divine initiative. There's a lot more we could say there, uh, but I want to go to a more positive element of this. My, my, my argument so far has been largely to try to undermine some of the reflexive ways in which we talk about human faith. Um, here, I think that the place in Paul's letters that is most helpful to us is his notion of the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ, page 16, that provides a rich theological location for understanding not only our connections to one another, but our shared weakness and our shared strength. Typically, I find that when we talk about the body of Christ, it's often by way of talking about the need for unity. We're all in this together. And it's sort of, you could transfer it to, I said the Rotary Club yesterday, you know, pick any human, human group you want to think of. We tend to talk about the unity of the body and neglect Christ. But if we stay with that image for a bit, 
uh, what we find is that our belonging to one another is a belonging to the weak and broken and shamed body of Christ. Uh, so our individual brokenness rightfully belongs in that body, not outside it. Um, I go on to talk about how it's not just a weak body, it is simultaneously a strong body that is because of Christ, uh, or God being in Christ, is powerful beyond our capacity to imagine. Um, Swinton uses the notion of God's memory, uh, that, that no matter what happens to us, no matter what we become or what we are, we cannot be lost to the memory of God. In Pauline terms, I'm using this notion of the body of Christ to accomplish a similar thing. We cannot be lost to the body of Christ, which is capable of holding all of us with whatever our strengths and weaknesses may be. So, uh, page 19, and, and watching my time here, uh, how, do, how does this weak and powerful body that belongs to Christ respond to the divine? Uh, first, it, to reiterate a theme earlier, it is, uh, it is the body that receives. It receives the spiritual gift. It receives faith. It is also a body, uh, page 20, that upbuilds. Um, it is a body that engages in the praise of God. These are all issues that came up uh, yesterday in my lecture, so for some of you, those will, will be very familiar themes. Uh, I'm going to go to the top of 21 and read the rest of this. Toward the end of his study of dementia, John Swinton narrates the story of Mary, a young woman with multiple disabilities. She is unable to speak. Uh, she can make sound. She experiences constant muscle spasms, has limited vision. She's dependent on others for all of her needs. She's been included in a Quaker community since infancy and is taken regularly to their services. According to Swinton, sometimes during the Quaker meeting, she will shout, producing long, rather winsome wails. When the service moves to periods of silence, she also becomes silent. Some years ago, Mary was diagnosed with leukemia. As her mother, deeply upset, was trying to explain this diagnosis to Mary, Mary in turn became upset and began to weep. Now, as Swinton notes, we can offer a number of explanations of her behavior. Reading that account with Paul makes me think that Mary's responses have been shaped by her experience of Christ's body within the Quaker community. People like Mary who are not able to make faith statements as we think of them, who do not believe in our limited uh, sense of the term, are held by the response of others, and they are shaped by that response. Notice that Mary is never exhorted to respond in a particular way. Her community shapes her for cries unutterable, for silence, and also for weeping with those who weep. In turn, those of us who are so impoverished maybe I should say incapacitated, that we think the human response to God is about what we do, perhaps we are held in that same body by those whose wisdom is of a different sort. All of us together produce nothing more than the cry for God's deliverance. Thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Our respondent is Dr. Nicholas Perrin, the uh, Franklin S. Dianus Professor of Biblical Studies at Wheaton Graduate School, uh, and I'd like to invite him now to come and, and give his response. Okay, thank you. Oh, Beverly, thank you for a fascinating paper. Nick, and would, would you mind standing standing just center? with the live stream? We can do that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'll bring my mic with me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, anyway, I do want to thank you, and it's, um, it's an honor to be responding to a Pauline scholar of your stature, Beverly, and it's a pleasure for me to be here today. I think that I appreciate how last evening David provided some context for his own issues of agreement and disagreement. Maybe it's helpful for me to do the same. I, I sense that some of my disagreement might arise out of a fundamentally different blick on Paul. Uh, I, I know, Beverly, that you uh, subscribe to an apocalyptic reading of Paul. I tend to be more of a covenantal Paul. Uh, maybe I'm being here. I'm, I don't know, better, better suited audience. I don't know. I don't want to play to the crowd here. So anyway, um, but the, I, I, which I think in turn is in some ways an extension of 17th century debates between the Reform gang and the Lutheran gang into the present. What is the human response to the gospel of Paul? So anyway, I have things that I really agree with and I really want to commend you on. I've got some questions and then I have some reservations. Uh, first, issues of agreement and you know way to go. I really loved how you raised the issue of normalcy and, and how we so often construct an account of humanity on the basis of majority experience and how today we just can no longer do that. In fact, I think uh, to work that one of my colleagues at Wheaton, Mark Cortez, is doing on the image of God and saying basically we're now at a point where we have to discard the, the structural account of the image of God, which has traditionally placed so much emphasis on the rational faculty, going back to Aquinas, well, going back earlier, but we think about the reformers as well. And, and not only in, in theology, but, but the philosophical tradition. And, and we can't help but wonder, you know, and smile wryly perhaps when we think, when we ask ourselves, you know, what if Immanuel Kant had married and adopted his mentally retarded children? Uh, would the critique of pure reason have ever possibly been written, <laughs> basing a system of ethics on a kind of rational capacity, rational choices? So uh, I, I just encourage you that uh, taking that same general direction and applying to the study of Paul, I think is absolutely the way to go, where we have to question standard assumptions as to what constitutes humanity uh, and how those faculties can sometimes have an inflated role in all that. So thank you very much for that. I think that as far as the questions and points of clarity, I have a couple issues. Uh, one, I was struck by uh, your discomfort with a notion of the gospel in which God makes an offer in which human beings are free to accept or decline. Uh, I suppose I, I just, in the first place, want clarity as to whether you are saying that uh, you would see a devaluation of a transaction where I, as a human being, make a kind of conscious acceptance of the gospel offer. Is that how somehow inferior to somebody who just you know, slowly fades into it. So I'm completely with you if, uh, uh, if we want to take on a kind of crass decisionalism which says you know, you're not really a Christian unless you can date it. Um, we don't want to go there. But have, have you swung to the other extreme to, to completely invalidate a kind of liminality in the conversion experience? And if that's not where you're going and you're saying that God gifts us you know, whether we like it or not, maybe even in contravention of our own desires, where does that leave human freedom? And I say that as a Calvinist, a thoroughgoing Calvinist. So uh, that's uh, one question about human freedom and where that really works in uh, your account, or Paul's account. Um, secondly, I think I want to raise questions about uh, your settling in on upbuilding. I, I certainly don't want to disagree with Paul. I don't think anyone in this room wants to disagree with Paul that edification is an important part of life in the body. But it's curious as to um, why you focus in on that particular Pauline exhortation when it's really just one component of a wide range of ethical exhortations, including, for example, admonish one another in Romans 15, 14, and Colossians 3, 16. Paul has uh, different directives for us in the body of Christ, and... Um, I'm curious as to why, for you, uh, it, it just struck me as somewhat arbitrary that you, you, that you, that you focused in on, on uh, building one another up. And in that connection, I, I also thought it was a little bit curious um, 
your line about where you say on page 20, if the role of the body of Christ is, is not to patrol the boundaries, it is to upbuild. And I, I find that curious, and maybe I also want to build on uh, the talk from last night, because to me, when I read a text like Galatians and 1 Corinthians, it, I can't come away from reading texts like that and, and surmising that actually the problem is no one's willing to patrol the boundaries in Galatia uh, or in Corinth, and Paul's aghast that they're not willing to do that. And I, and I think about the whole question of who are we doing theology for, and I understand that when we do theology, we're doing it within the, the context of our own experience, where we run into people who are awfully keen to patrol the boundaries, um, and perhaps too keen. At the same time, when I think of, say, the work of Christian Smith, as he talks about the millennials, and, uh, and I mean, I'm talking about my kids, who are bo both teenagers, and I meet their friends, and the problem isn't that they're too keen to patrol the boundaries. They don't have boundaries. And, and so I, what, what I like to see is how can we do theology in a way that puts some, not culture war boundaries in place, we don't want a perpetuation of culture wars, but where does Paul draw the line on, on some of these issues, and how can we talk about those boundaries in a way that's actually going to make sense in our culture and be plausible in our culture? Uh, I, I think thirdly is I was, I, I was wondering whether at the end of the day, you can carry through the thought experiment without really bringing to bear Paul's notion of the image of God. Uh, how do we talk about divine res human response to divine initiative without talking about the very structure of humanity? In, you know, we think about 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 8, 28, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. For Paul, the image of God is absolutely a huge category. And it would seem to me, to, to be able to really give an account of human responsiveness, it has to, if not be in the context of the image of God doctrine, at least tip its hat uh, in that way. And so I think in closing, I, I have a paragraph in my notes, I think it's just easier to, to read it just to be crisp in my summation. So the quest for a theological account of human response that does justice to the full range of our broken humanity is a commendable quest indeed. And you've served us well by calling us to avoid positing a one-size-fits-all phenomenology on the classic basis of the human rational faculty. At the same time, I'm not certain that the counterproposal you propose involving a description of human responsiveness in the lowest common denominator terms of our creatureliness finally succeeds either as an account of um, Paul's handling of the issue or as a constructive path forward. So in my view, the scriptures would suggest that all human response is contextual and constrained, and all individuals are morally obliged to re respond fully to God, fully within the confines of their individual capacities. Thus I suspect, this I suspect is the point of Jesus' parable of the talents. This too seems to be the same principle lingering behind Paul's paranetic phrase, in proportion to each one's faith, Romans 12. Or, as Paul puts it elsewhere, for if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have, 2 Corinthians 8.12. So, while Beverly, I believe you're correct to deny that human responsiveness is identical with the exercise of human capacity, I think you fail to appreciate uh, to uh, due extent that Paul, among other biblical writers, that our capacities, however limited, are nonetheless the platform in which human response finds expression. Thanks. Look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the second, we'll open it up for, for questions and comments from the floor, but the presenter always gets the right of first response, so back over to Beverly. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. That was a, a thoughtful response and a, a very constructive one. I think under the surface, and it may not be obvious to everybody else in the room, but under the surface, much of our disagreement does have to do with the way we're reading Paul, um, in part, is, especially in response to your last paragraph, I would say that um, one of the things I sort of skipped over in this is I think for Paul there is a profound disability for the human critter. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the incapacity produced by sin is such that um, uh, the, 
the, uh, the gospel comes as event that does something. So there, there's a kind of bigger disagreement between us. However, uh, there, there are many places here where we ag agree. Let me just make a couple of comments about your three, what I took to be your three main points. Um, I think Paul's understanding of human freedom is far more limited than our own. Um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with Romans 6 as describing the prior enslavement to sin and the current enslavement to righteousness. These, it's not that there's some third place where people exist. They're one or the other. I don't think Paul has uh, our understanding of freedom. Uh, and I, again, I'm impressed with the way he talks about his own, uh, what we call his conversion, as being overtaken. You know, it, this is not someone who made a, a, a kind of decision. There are those elements, you know, I, I, I think because I react a little bit against a kind of American emphasis, Western emphasis on the autonomous self, and I want to play up these other elements that I do take to be important. Um, my choice of upbuilding may be rather arbitrary. I, I was not attempting to write a systematic account of uh, everything Paul might say about the human response, but taking into account this question of incapacity and how we think about the, what the body of Christ does, it seemed to me that uh, building, which is so important in both 1 Corinthians and Romans, uh, is a way of talking about what we may do for one another, depending on various gifts and capacities. Um, I certainly agree that there is in Paul a building up of boundaries. Uh, First Thessalonians, I think, I, I've taught First Thessalonians for years, and I get about three minutes into the discussion, and I'm doing this every time. You know, what Paul is doing is trying to defend this little community. But it does strike me, and I said something about this yesterday, it does strike me that alongside consolidating these communities, he doesn't stigmatize the outside. He doesn't resort to that in ways that I think have become so problematic for some Christians. And I, you know, I certainly agree with your, your comments about uh, the millennials. Um, it, along, along that same line, this patrolling of boundaries did remind me of uh, a, a friend of ours whose local congregation, I told this story the other night at dinner, whose local congregation asked her, please not to come back. Uh, when her dementia became so pronounced that it was uncomfortable for them. That's the kind of boundary patrolling we don't need. And you're not advocating that, I understand that. Um, image of God, absolutely. I, uh, I, I suppose, you know, my defense on this is I do, at this moment, read everything through Romans. And that's, that's a very slim piece of Romans. It's there, but it's, it's, it seems to me in Romans it's not so much reclaiming the image of God as it is giving it. Um, I, I may be wrong about that, but I, I think uh, this is going to come up in Paul Lim's paper as well. The image of God uh, language could be used, again, to talk about, to problematize the way in which we understand that image as being an image of strength. Uh, and I think I could, I could build on that rather nicely. So thanks again. Well, it's time to open it to the floor. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, if you could indicate just by raising your hand. Uh, if you could then uh, wait until the microphone reaches you uh, and stand and identify yourself and then, then ask your question. Uh, if a question occurs to you while the conversation's going on, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep looking down the room. I'll just, if you can try and catch my eye, I'll jot down uh, a list of those who are waiting to ask questions. And, and that way, we'll try to give the maximum number of people the opportunity. Okay, so it's open to the floor for questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Anne, and I'm a third year MDiv student here. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate it on page 21 when you were talking about Mary, um, and you talked about the 
those who cannot cognitively assent to that belief that it, it um, that it's the it's held the, the the response is held by the response of others, um, and so um, wondering if you could flush that out a little more. Of do you think it's the responsibility of the community to hold those um, in their own community hold their faith in that um, those that can't make the cognitive assent, um, or is there another form of a faithful human response, human relationship to God that those with like severe um, mental illness can have? And, and is this where you're talking about giftedness? Um, so that's my thing. Yeah, those are really good questions. And I, I must say, I'm only uh, beginning to think about this. As I said in the very last part of the paper, this is a kind of thought experiment. I think it's both and. Uh, I think there's this sense, as we talk about intercessory prayer, sometimes we pray for people who are unable to pray for themselves. Uh, is there a way in which the, the notion of God's memory, which is what Swinton works with, uh, holds us all so that we, we in, in some sense, hold, we, we create faith for one another uh, in this community? And you have this, this extreme example of Mary uh, who's, who, for whom we have no, uh, we have no w witness to her active faith, but the, the faith of the community seems to have shaped her. Um, and I lost your, your second part of that, which, um, sorry. Yeah, is there another form of faithful response? Sure, I, I, I did not, you know, there are all sorts of ways of talking about this. My husband has been for, you know, 40 years and more now uh, involved in ministry uh, on behalf of and alongside folks with intellectual disabilities. So he could come in and tell us stories all day and all night uh, about ways in which uh, people with varying degrees of intellectual disability uh, exhibit faith, and I'm not trying to say they don't do it in, in some ways that look very much like ours. What I'm trying to do is push the limit here. Uh, and, you know, Nick picked up on this beautifully in terms of the question of what's normal and why do we think we're the ones who are normal. Our next question was right at the back. Larry Kemphausen, a covenant pastor here in Chicago. Um, I really connect with your paper um, as a minister and working in a small community and working with children, but also people coming to faith in our um, context, whatever we want to label it. Um, and so I, I guess I'd like you to comment on two experiences as a minister. Um, one is I have a family and young children, and they weren't comfortable with infant baptism per se. So um, they felt they wanted to wait for their children to have some response um, to faith, to what was happening in the community. Um, we did baptize both of their children very young, um, one at about two, the other just a few weeks ago, um, just before, um, about a, a year and a half old. Um, and in both cases, the decision by the parents that they wanted to baptize their children had to do with their response to our worship in our community um, and basically around communion. And the most recent mm -hmm. one, I was d uh, giving out the bread um, and the young, the infant reached out for the bread. And I didn't feel I could refuse that. <laughs> and then we talked about that after the service and we both, we all agreed that that was a response, mm -hmm. that the child was having faith. Mm -hmm. Now, we also agreed that we couldn't tell you what that was. <laughs> um, we had no definition for what, but we were recognizing God at work um, in our community, in the child, in the family. Um, the other is a more complex thing, and not someone who had no ability, who's I, I perfectly... Um, capable human being in our sense of the term, in our modern sense. He's a uh, technician, works with open source um, programming, um, very intelligent human resources um, person at, North, at, a, at a hospital in town. Um, 
And when he came into our community, uh, he had no sense of God or faith or spirituality. Um, and in the about the first six months to year with our community, he didn't say anything. We have a time of response after our sermons, but he consistently cried after a worship service, and he couldn't give any articulation to that. Um, and I often just sat with him in his crying, but also recognized that as a response of faith. It wasn't cognitive. It wasn't anything that I would have predicted or anything that my seminary education told me I would expect, <laughs> um, though um, the desert fathers do seem to talk about, and mothers do seem to talk about faith and tears. So I just invite your response to those two um, situations in my context. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you for that. I think those are, are both uh, things I would plot along this, this notion of the, what the body of Christ does. Um, apart from being ba baptized, or in, in the case of the young man, uh, there is something there that is well beyond, I'm just restating what you've said, that's written well beyond the cognitive that is, uh, uh, that is pulling both the child and the young man in. And we can name it as a work of the spirit. Uh, we, but I, I think this notion of body of Christ, uh, in, in, in Paul it's both, he's not that these are mutually exclusive, nor would I attempt to uh, analyze them too finely in terms of one does one thing and one does the other. Uh, but this, the, the community itself, as with Mary, shapes these responses. They didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hannah. Hi, my name is Hannah Andre. I'm a teaching fellow in church history here at North Park. And you problematize uh, a theological anthropology that takes as its starting point a certain normative level of human capacity. But I wonder if kind of dispensing with that way of um, doing a theological anthropology kind of accounts adequately for gospel accounts right, that see Jesus healing and performing exorcisms, right? So it kind of takes as an ideal a certain level of human um, capacity or health. Um, and also whether um, it kind of does justice to the lived experience of those. I mean, you mentioned dementia, but yesterday also brought in kind of um, different mental illness, depression, right? That would see that um, kind of not not as an ideal, but um, would seek kind of a deliverance. Yeah, I, I am putting deliberately putting together a number of things that I, I don't mean to equate them, and certainly in some instances, uh, people can be delivered and are healed, and I celebrate that. I don't, but, but um, the, the question, for example, having to do with healing, as some of you will know, in disability uh, co uh, communities now, that's become a very fraught uh, issue. Uh, why is it assumed that I have to be that in order to be okay? You know? And that's a very contentious point. I have now said probably more than I know about it. Um, I, I, I'm deliberately dealing here, you know, with, uh, this is my default defense, I'm deliberately dealing with Paul uh, in part because I want to problem, I, I want to deal with one part of the canon and not lose this particular voice, which we tend to do. But I certainly grant that there is uh, evidence of healing. Thank God there's evidence of healing in particularly in some of these arenas in the 21st century as well. But for those people for whom healing does not happen, that I don't want us to um, define them as not human you know, and not persons. And this does happen in philosophical, in, in discussion of philosophical ethics. I've had these conversations. Swinton has a whole chapter about it, where the assumption is unless you are uh, capacitated to do certain things, you are not really a person. And that, to me, in a Christian context, is unthinkable. So I'll, I'll just be that blunt about it. I have opinions. Uh, Joel. 
My name is Joel Johnson. I'm a covenant pastor in Rochester, Minnesota. For your uh, paper. Um, thinking about the posture of receiving, and then you talk about the body of Christ also being one that praises God together. I was thinking about um, you know, the receiving act, what God has given, receiving what God has given, and then the response. And Paul writes elsewhere, and, and in Romans, quite a bit about love. And it made me think about um, the, the commandment we have to love God with all our heart, uh, heart, mind, all our soul, and all our strength or our might. And what does that look like from a, um, a position of incapacity, whether it's um, an imposed incapacity by uh, a slave master or, or the physical or mental incapacity to love God with our heart, soul, and strength? I would like to hear some other people talk about this. I, the thing that comes to me immediately is that I think when biblical writers are talking about love, they're almost never talking about uh, the sort of love we have in mind. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 that, uh, he's, that, that you have loved all of the... I'm going to get this wrong now. You're going to help me out. You've loved all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. How is that possible? You don't know them. You know, I mean, sometimes in class I play with this. It may be easier to love them if you don't know them. Uh, but what is, it, what is talked about there is an, a, an attachment to this other, these other people that respects, the, that acknowledges the image of God in them, uh, that is, um, uh, that sees in them uh, the the image of God, the body of Christ, so that it, it in that sense, I think uh, our acting out in community, our love of one another, is not liking necessarily. Um, and I, you know, I, I've I've given so many focal points for thinking about this that it's it's very difficult. Uh, to zero in on one here and one there because they're not comparable, and I admit that. But uh, those of you who have been with uh, people who have uh, various forms of intellectual ability, uh, intellectual disability, know that from some of them you would get much more love and much more joy uh, than, than uh, we generate ourselves. Uh, and we learn, that's one of the things where we, I would say we are upbuilt by examples that are uh, not so restricted by uh, our own priority on uh, intellectual ability. And then immediately behind Joel. Hi, I'm A. Lanois, um, a final year MDiv student. Uh, we talked about the community shaping and supporting those with um, mental incapacities and with um, perhaps um, mental issues such as depression, but it seems to me that the church deals very poorly with those who seem to have a moral incapacity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just thinking of a woman that I've been speaking with who was raised in an abusive home and mm -hmm has known nothing but addictions. Um, and I, I would see that as almost a moral incapacity. She doesn't know how to, mm -hmm. to respond to God. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for that. I, I suppose, I mean, I, I don't have thoughts on it in terms of uh, an immediate practical strategy, you know, and, and you shouldn't trust me if I tried to offer any. Mm -hmm. But I think that for Paul, you know, one of the things I learned from Romans is that for Paul, we, we, humanity as a whole has been morally incapacitated. So to the extent that, that in the gospel, by grace, some of us experience a certain level of moral capacity, uh, our response to the other uh, needs to be a recognition of the, needs to begin with a recognition of commonality. That that person is not different from me in species. It's not different from me 
it, 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 it's different from us in degree, you know, not in, um, uh, not in some ultimate way. Uh, I, to me, that would be the beginning point, is recognizing that that is uh, not just, you know, um, uh, hate the sin and love the sinner. I almost said that the wrong way around. Um, uh, but recognizing that, that, that I, I, too, stand in that place. And I think Paul's, you, you, Paul's really quite uh, global language about all in Adam being held in sin and death. You know, that means that none of us is licensed to, have, to, to sit on a moral high ground with respect to other people. Even though I do it on a regular basis. I mean, those, you know, we, all, we do that, uh, but one of the functions of the canon is to keep calling us back, you know, and to keep uh, helping us to see that we are, uh, uh, in this instance, that we are, we all belong uh, under, we all stand under judgment. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you also raised a, you know, a, a strong ethical dimension in your response. Is there, is there anything you'd like to add at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I, was inter- I, I was thinking about your proposal, Beverly, and, uh, against maybe the backdrop of theological history as limited as my understanding is of it. And it's, it strikes me that I think you're completely on the right track on what you're setting out to do. I think where you end up, to me, seems kind of Schleiermacher in, in the sense. Oh, God forbid. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> you know, so, but, you know, for, but for, you know, for Schleiermacher, it, you know, it was unabhängigkeit gefühl that was that the, the feeling of absolute dependence that was the center of his ethics. And that's, that seems, you know, somewhat reminiscent of, or at least your proposal seems somewhat reminiscent of, you know, a consciousness of, as receivers or being dependent people. It seems Schleiermacher to me. But I think the, the thing where we re- realize with Schleiermacher is that that could only go so far in really advancing things. But I, I think about, um, you know, Romans 6, I think about Irenaeus. And Irenaeus' account of the image of God, it was just our bodies, mm-hmm. which I'm very sympathetic to. Um, because in some sense, that's the most inclusive mm-hmm. account of the image of God. And I think, you know, if, if there's a kind of central point for Paul where he says, where he talks about human response, I think of Romans 6. Mm-hmm. Present your bodies mm-hmm. in, 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 in all its limited capacity. So I, mm-hmm. I was just curious maybe as to whether you thought that would be a... Um, I mean, what, what do you think about that? The, 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 if, we, if we just took this down to... Our, um, our humanity as being a function of being a human body. Uh, I think in Paul's sense, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, I think in Paul's sense that's right because mm-hmm. at least I, I take it that the body is the whole person, right? right. Not, not just the whole physical capable, body. Right. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. I'm, I, it's going to take me days to recover from being associated with Schleiermacher. <laughs> no, I'm so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just going in order, I think Rob is next. Yeah. Rob, you need the microphone. Just to widen the conversation and uh, outside of biblical studies, uh, but and to invite conversation or not from the two of you, I was thinking of Flannery O'Connor. Um, O'Connor put the discussion of disability, stood it on its head. Mm -hmm. And rather than try to say, as disability studies often does, oh yeah, we're just all different but equal, when obviously it's not so good to be blind, Mm -hmm. um, she said, we're all equally disabled. Mm -hmm. We're sinners in need of grace. And so the whole discussion wasn't an attempt to, to sort of patch up equality right. at, at, the, at the level of, right. of perfection, but to say we all are in need of entry into the body of Christ. It, mm-hmm. it seems to me that's mm-hmm. a helpful yeah. um, other perspective. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'm thinking of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's ethics in which he 
mounts an argument that as part of the human community, we, including Christ, are all guilty, even though we might be sinless. And that that, that quite provocative idea that we, we participate mm -hmm. in that fallenness might be helpful in your opening several pages mm -hmm. where you're talking about the slaves mm -hmm. and what they <laughs> do and don't do. Um, I, I actually yes. found the slave one a more troublesome more, and in a sense more provocative arena uh -huh. for further discussion uh -huh. than disability. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the slave is actually doing something that the slave doesn't want to do right. and that within the body of Christ is thought other than what we should do. Right. That, right. That's a more complicated It's a issue. very messy, troubling uh, circumstance. So, yeah. so anyway, those are uh, Bonhoeffer yeah. and yeah. Flannery O'Connor yeah. might be conversation yeah. partners. Yeah, I, um, uh, Flannery is one of my saints, and uh, I, which is not to say that I know her work as well as I, uh, as I want to, but I regularly use Revelation uh, in classes on Paul uh, toward the very end, because if people haven't gotten yet how, how offensive he is, uh, then I figure Revelation will do it for them, and it usually does make at least somebody furious. Um, you know, Bart uh, uh, says that Paul always lives on the brink of heresy, and the problem with most books on Paul is that they, um, uh, they are so inoffensive. And I, I think it's, it, Flannery is a, a very helpful conversation partner at just that point. And I, I take your, um, you know, I, I really like your notion about all of us participate in fallenness. And, I, and again, I, the leap from, the, the difference between talking about slavery and talking about various forms of disability is a serious leap. It just helps me to surface this question and to make it a contemporary question. Now, you could do that in terms of talking about any number of people, say, uh, child soldiers. I made some reference to that yesterday. I was just trying to broaden this to something that does touch all of us somewhere or other. Uh, Jody, bye. Well, a couple things. I feel like I want to defend you on the Schleiermacher thing. <laughs> Me? Yes, I want oh. to because I don't think that um, saying that we are profoundly disabled and that the origin of our point of contact with God is our sense or feeling of our absolute dependence are the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, yeah. I think that that thank needs you. to be thank a you, thank different you. point. But I'm trying to stay in Roman so you won't dodge my question. <laughs> but that's hard because I'm a Mennonite and Romans makes me a little dizzy, especially the governing authority stuff. But I want to say about the person that is taking care of the dementia patient, okay? And they may find in this disabled vision of humanity a profound sense of God's presence, of divine presence, of the image of God. And they may respond to that then with what has to be a profound level of human care and faithfulness. And I'm just wondering, in, maybe in the context of slavery to righteousness and slavery to sin, as a parallel, what do you make of the, the kind of slavery that it takes to care for and respond to God in a disabled form in Flamina Less or in this, this image of God in this disabled form? What, did that, what about those kinds of bondages, that kind of bondage of, to righteousness? So. To be sure that I'm understanding you, Jody, um, the bondage to, you mean in a sense of the sense to which, the, the extent to which those who are caring for, say, somebody with profound dementia are I enacting their own uh, enslavement to righteousness? Is that yeah, I mean, I think, I think an instance? Yeah, I use the word righteousness because it sounds yeah. so yeah, self-righteous. Yeah. But right. I mean, like, right. I, like I said, I'm trying to keep you in Romans. Yeah. But my sense is just, what do you do with the, giving, a, I guess, a theological account of that kind of, right. that kind of right. faithfulness since you know, we have different, you know, we're always 
potentially disabled. Yes. But, but that also means that we have this call to care for. And yeah. Well, an interesting thing that one might do, I, I mean, again, going back to my husband's experience, it's so nice to speak for him since he's not here to correct me. Um, but Bill was for many years a chaplain in a, an old-fashioned you know, center for folks with, with uh, intellectual disability. And people would say, as they have many times over the years, oh, it takes such a special gift to do that. You know? Well, no, actually, you get a whole lot from that. You know, there's, there's a lot of joy. There's a, there's a lot of response. Uh, th th this was never for him a draining. Uh, this was for him always life-giving. Now, would that be for everybody? No. That's where we need to talk about the doctrine of vocation. You know? um, I guess to take that to Romans, the, the, the thing I would do would be this, to the extent that being slaves of righteousness sounds pretty grim, you know, and there are Christians who make, uh, uh, who make their duties into sort of uh, moral self-righteousness. The, the thing that's interesting to me about Paul is that he moves, and I mentioned this yesterday, he moves from the language of being slaves to righteousness to Romans 8 where he says, you're not going to fall back, don't fall back again into being slave, to be to slavery to fear, uh, but blah, blah, I lost it. You receive. You didn't receive a spirit of fear, slavery to fear, but a spirit of adoption by which we cry out. So this, this to the extent that this is a kind of slavery in a negative sense for Paul, it is renamed. It's more. It's not just renamed. It morphs into uh, being a member of the household. So there's a giftedness about it that doesn't come through altogether when we talk in ways that can sometimes sound very uh, self-congratulatory about our duties. Thank you for that. Yeah, maybe, uh, and that's where I really liked where you went with the paper, too. And, and yet my role here is to be critical, but I'm, again, very behind your project. I'll pay I, you later. Yeah, OK. <laughs> but I, I think about you know, for this whole business in 1 Corinthians 7, when Paul talks about the spouse being sanctified through the spouse and mm -hmm. the children being sanctified. You know, what's going on there? And, and maybe that whole idea of a kind of corporate sanctification mm -hmm. or God working on a kind of corporate level could find a nice home yeah, there. that's nice. And, you know, and I, actually I was a, a chaplain in an assisted living home for three years where I worked with dementia folks. And, you know, they, they could tell when they were in the presence of God's people. Mm -hmm. um, you can, people with very limited capacities, there's something just about, I mean, it raised my sacramentology doing what I did. And I think you're kind of driving at the very same thing. And so yeah. I'm square behind you. Good. Thank you. Right over here. Ina Grace Dietrich here in Hyde Park in Chicago. <clears throat> I want to thank you very much for your paper. And particularly, this is upon the role of the spirit, which, and perhaps I'm too influenced by Gordon Fee, but I think is very prominent in Paul. But I think what you're putting out here calls for a radical rethinking of our way of being church. Even though we've got lots of new experiments of community, for most of us, a traditional way of church emphasizes order and procedure and program. But the role, if you emphasize the spirit, then you're emphasizing receiving more than decision-making. And it also leads more to an emphasis on prayer and on worship. But for most of us in our congregations, um, I'm part of a small, struggling congregation in Hyde Park. We're in an interim period. We have folks from the University of Chicago, like myself with a PhD. We also have some mentally disabled people. And we really struggle with, we've got to do some planning. We've got to do some thinking about our past, about our future. But we also need to include these folks. And their cognitive abilities simply are at a different level. So we have to rethink what it means to be a community. And of course, then the issues of power and control. Um, we're also a racially diverse church, but we have mostly white folks in leadership. And mostly it's us more cognitive folks who are making decisions. 
but it calls for a different kind of understanding of community and maybe not doing some of the things we're currently doing. It, I think it's a more radical proposition for those of us in church life than maybe biblical scholars putting this stuff out realize. You know, that's the thing about reading the Bible is you never quite know what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, you may be taken places you didn't want to go. Uh, and, you know, I, that happens to me. And, and, and uh, when it stops happening, I'll know it's time to do something else. Um, and, I, and I mean that. I, I, you, you do find things that you just you didn't want to see and you don't r really want to have to deal with. Um, it does strike me that one resource, I mean, I, so I, I just want to affirm what you've said, one resource for thinking about this for your congregation might be the kind of thing that uh, Hans Reinders has done around friendship uh, with folks with uh, disability in particular. And he's very influenced by uh, John Bonnier. Um, and I, I think that, that gets at the question of how do we, uh, especially those of us who do have you know, the PhD thing, uh, th that causes us to be really very limited people, you know, and where do, where do we receive uh, from others uh, an under uh, the g other gifts in life that, that w we're, we've shut ourselves off from? So, thank you. Uh, Jeff, did you have a question? No. There's, Jeff, one, uh, there's one back here. Uh, and then it was this gentleman over here that was next. Yeah. Paul. Hello, my name's Paul Wilson from the University of Toronto, and, and I'm really appreciative of this conversation. It's very helpful and stimulating. Um, so many uh, different angles that are being presented and stories. Uh, I, I'm reminded of um, an editorial John Buchanan wrote some years mm -hmm. ago in the Christian Century, mm -hmm. where he spoke about his daughter, mm -hmm. or his granddaughter, his going granddaughter. to confirmation class with the other students, his granddaughter, I think her name was Rachel, I could be wrong, uh, had Down syndrome. And uh, on the Sunday when they were to be confirmed, each one was to stand up and make a statement of testimony to the others, who, to the congregation. And he was concerned uh, that she wouldn't be able to repeat the, the creeds and talk about what that meant in, in the same way that others children were ex expected to do. And what she did is she stood up and she spoke about how she had gone with the others to a food kitchen and, mm -hmm. and Jesus was there. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was a, in some ways a more profound mm -hmm. statement of belief than the, her ability or not, lack of ability mm -hmm. to come up with the creedal statement. Uh, I'm also reminded of a, a <laughs> comment that one of my professors said to me. He said, um, sometimes in relation to the creeds, not everyone is able to say everything on that particular Sunday. That is, some mm -hmm. of us may be suffering from depression on a particular Sunday. Some of us might not understand what that means. Or if we thought we understood it, it you know, we're, there are different ways and he said, we have to be willing to let the community do our believing for us. Sometimes we have to let the community do our believing for us. And I wonder if there isn't something there mm -hmm. that, that, we, that we put too much emphasis on individual, mm -hmm. uh, a notion of individuality that Paul's time wouldn't have known, mm -hmm. a kind of independence standing almost separate from the body. Uh, and then we plug ourselves into the body. Mm -hmm. But rather, it, what if we had a notion of identity that was so rooted in the body of Christ that we could not think of others as separate from it? Mm -hmm. That is, that if somebody has some kind of disability, that's our disability. Right. It's, it's not that person's right. disability. It's not, it's not a problem that has to be dealt with. It's who we are and, and how we come together uh, as a community is really what what matters. It's, in other words, it's not my body that matters so much as the whole body mm -hmm. which cares for my body and everyone else's body. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that entirely, and I would say you've just said what I was trying to get at better than I did in terms of the body of Christ. Um, the, the problem that I sometimes have with that image is that it's, it, it just functions as a kind of, uh, in our discourse, as a kind of, we should all get along. Uh, but, but there's much more uh, involved, and, and we should, I'm all for that. But uh, there's much more at stake in that in terms of what the, uh, of the bodies bearing Christ uh, for others and along with others. And you've said that beautifully. And there's a question at the back that I've missed. Yeah. Valerie. Um, okay, two things. One is I kind of want to piggyback on Jody's question because you answered Jody's question in regards to caregiver has a vocation, mm -hmm. but not I'm married or my aunt who suddenly becomes. So I, it's not a vocation, it's not so much chose, but now I'm responsible for this person, so that's one. And then secondly, um, the slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, part now, mind you, I'm reading into the African American perspective. Right. Um, but when I look at that, and then when I see you and placing that in conversation with dementia, mm -hmm. has no longer there. I'm thinking of that person at one time was considered by the community, by the larger society, as human, who's no longer there. While slavery especially African-American, they were not even human at the beginning to be no longer there. So if you could just speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the, on the first one, when I use the word vocation, uh, I, I don't mean choice. Uh, I mean what, is called upon, what we're called upon to do that we may, we may find we don't want to do. I think there are a fair number of people who are in a, a lot of vocations who wouldn't have chosen those. Uh, so at least in this sense, uh, that's, uh, uh, but I, I do take your point that it, it's not welcome, it's not what any one of us would have chosen um, uh, for ourselves. But I think the word vocation can go in, a, in, in more than one direction there. Um, uh, yes, uh, one of the things that, uh, and it comes up in someone else's paper, uh, that is, important for me from, from Orlando Patterson's work on, uh, groundbreaking work on slavery, is that it is, it does deny the person from the beginning, right? And so these are different at this point, although, of course, there are forms of intellect, of forms not just of intellectual but physical disability that produce the same, the same argument. And uh, it, across all of those, I think it's important for us to say, however different they are, any time we find ourselves saying, um, uh, this is not a person, we have to ask ourselves what kind of definition we're using and whether that definition is not uh, corrupt, uh, whether that definition is God's definition. So thank you for that. Uh, There's someone here, yeah. Uh, then Cheryl, right in the back. Thank you. It's a very thought-provoking paper. I especially love the line, and all of us together produce nothing more than um, the cry for God's deliverance. And I was thinking this morning on the way in, um, of how we all probably need a new soteriology in terms of um, the inability to match the cultures of death in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, that I just have no words for it. Uh, mm -hmm. We have no language for it. And uh, there is so much um, pain and suffering and death that mm -hmm. um, sort of a forensic justification view of salvation doesn't do it. And, um, one of my mentors, Richard Shaw, in the latter years of his life, uh, you know, he said that uh, what he saw among the many poor in Latin America was a theology of the reconstruction of life in the face of death, people who live on their own death row, 
um, who find um, healing and deliverance. So the words healing and deliverance become the critical marks of, of, uh, of salvation. And also I wanted to, um, you know, just ask in, in sense that um, the, the attention I think that you're moving us toward, uh, Paul's use of parody and satire and even mockery so that the, the strong confound the weak mm -hmm. and uh, the, um, the foolish confound the wise. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the light of your whole paper, I sense maybe everything's turned over, just the whole fruit basket turnover. Mm -hmm. So we who are weak do not sanctify, I mean, we who are strong do not sanctify the weak, but the weak actually save and sanctify us. Uh, and that in order to be saved, like Flannery O'Connor, sometimes I call myself Ruby Turpin. Yeah. You know, I'll go, oh, Ruby, that was good. And I know what I'm saying to myself. I have yeah. become Ruby Turpin. Right. I have become a good, respectable woman. And uh, I need sometimes something thrown at me. <laughs> and I, I wonder, too, the liturgy that we have today. We don't have liturgy that honors, I think, the um, capacity of the weak to sanctify the strong so that um, they're not just placed in, in the worshiping community, but that we allow them with their, their words and their prayers uh, to give us uh, God's grace. I was thinking about my friend who's now passed away, but she was sort of a mentor to me in ministry, and she um, had severe physical deformities when she was a child, dramatically healed, but not completely healed. She would crawl around on the floor, but God immediately healed her one day. And she could walk, but she always walked with a limp. And she had to have a cane. And when she got that healing as a young child, she was called into ministry and became a great uh, evangelist in our tradition. Went to West Africa at the age of 70 and had to return from Ghana due to dementia. So she was part of our congregation and we gave her a seat of honor on the front row and because she could no longer preach to follow her outline which was very frustrating but she would sit on the front row and she was part of our prayer team and it seemed as her dementia would increase her ability to give words of knowledge and prophecy increased and um, people would come to her she would just read their book and I remember she came up to my husband one day uh, a couple of years ago after her service, and he thought she was going to do the usual. That was a great uh, sermon, and she would say it over and over because she had forgotten that she had just said that. But she looked right at him, and she, she gave him a word about how our ministry was going to completely change in the church and shift. Everything she, has, she said has come to pass. Everything. It was a very clear word. So what I, I think she's teaching, she taught us, is that in some way she sanctified us. We didn't just sanctify her, uh, her incapacity. And I wonder how we can construct, back on your question earlier about the PhDs and the others, um, construct uh, forms of community and liturgy that we just don't care for but we receive from, um, and that, that in some way, God mocks us with these people. Yeah, um, watching the time, just a couple of sentences about that. I, I, I love your last comment, particularly God mocks us, but I, it mocks our values. And I, I, you know, to me, I'm, as you talk, I'm hearing uh, 1 Corinthians 1. See, I'll step out of Romans when it suits me. Um, you know, I'm hearing 1 Corinthians 1, and I'm hearing 2 Corinthians 5, and that, that notion of uh, uh, epistemology, how the cross produces a radically different way of understanding what's strong and weakness, of assessing ourselves. And I, I believe that works, uh, I, I believe that runs throughout his correspondence, although I think you see it most prominently there. Um, and and that's just a, a, an issue we have to look at, we have to hold before ourselves and sit with day after day after day because we are so tempted to uh, lapse into 
corrupted ways of thinking about other people and ourselves, and because, you know, to name it, we're all so afraid. I mean, one of the reasons for leaving dementia in this paper is because it scares us. And I, I'm pretty sure I can speak for a number of people with that. It's not just me. That, it's just not just me. It scares us. Uh, I'm not scared of becoming a first century slave. That, uh, that I can talk about, I might get upset, but it, I, that's not apt to happen. Uh, but dementia scares me in, because it so deeply uh, 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 encounters the way in which I've understood myself. So there may be other issues that, that impinge on other people's self-understanding, but in all of those, we're looking at what we mean when we talk about strength and weakness and how we have uh, allowed ourselves to be, uh, uh, how we have been shaped by a culture that sees those in ways that are very limited. So. Yeah, Nick, you raised the, the question of communal sanctification. Uh, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you want to come in on that question in particular because it seems to be traveling down a similar path? Yeah, oh, I completely agree. I think, you know, as, as I've been teaching now for 12 years, I think in the past five years, I've really just come to see the gospel in a completely different way. How, I mean, and as Americans, this is so hard for us to grasp, partially because the autonomy was completely one of community and solidarity. But the other unexamined datum in American theology is power and how that underrides uh, th this whole issue of power, at least in you know, white middle class circles to which I, which I associate with. It's, it's never looked at, but for Paul, it's front and center. And, um, and I, I, I was uh, teaching the other night, I was talking about the Gospel of Mark and how it seems like American evangelicalism is very high on Mark chapter one day. He is the Messiah. Okay, but then Mark 9 through 16, so what? It means serving. It means laying down your life. It means making sure the weak are up here and the strong are down here. We stink at that in, 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 our, in our American Christianity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, our time is gone. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Please join me in expressing our appreciation to our presenter and respondent.